So if you're watching this video because there's something specific in 1 Samuel 25 to chapter 27 that you want to learn, then hopefully this video can help you with that. But I want to let you know at the bare minimum, this is day 93 of our Through the Bible in one year study. And at the very least, I'm going to recommend you go back to at least the beginning of our first Samuel playlist. And I'll make sure I link that in the description box below for you to watch that as well. So let's get started. And Samuel died and all the Israelites were gathered together and lamented him and buried him in his house at Ramah. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. And a man in Maon, whose possessions in Carmel, and a man very great, and he had three thousand sheep and a thousand goats, and he was, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now the name of the man Nabal, and the name of his wife Abigail, and a woman of good understanding, of a beautiful countenance, but the man churlish and evil in his doings, and he of the house of Caleb. And David heard in the wilderness that Nabal did shear his sheep, and David sent out ten young men, and David said unto the young men, Get you up to Carmel, and go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. And thus shall you say to him that liveth, Peace both to thee, and peace to thine house, and peace unto all that thou hast. And now I have heard that thou hast shearers. Now thy shepherds which were with us, we hurt them not. Neither was there aught missing unto them, all the while they were in Carmel. Ask thy young men, and they will shew thee. Wherefore let the young men find favour in thine eyes, for we come in a good day. Give, I pray thee, whatsoever cometh to thine hand, unto thy servants, and to thy son David. So there's a couple of things we see to start the narrative in regards to the chapters we're reading today. And some of the things I highlighted are, Samuel dies, and the people are obviously mourning. That's the first thing we see. And it's really interesting that not much is really spoken of in regards to Samuel. It's just he's died, they buried him in, in the city where he lived in Ramah, and basically the people mourn, and that kind of it. The narrative shifts. So we get introduced to these two characters. Nabal and his wife Abigail and it's really interesting because the scripture tells us that number one Nabal was this kind of evil guy which is kind of setting up the scene to what's actually going to happen and then we see Abigail is this woman she's beautiful and she's actually quite wise now something else that's quite interesting that um, I've actually missed um, several times reading through this and as I was actually reading through it to prepare for this it kind of stood out to me this time that he was actually of the house of Caleb. That means he was from Judah as well, similar to David, which is actually quite powerful. And the next one we basically see is that David goes on to send 10 young men to him. And I wrote three things here. He, he sent them out in peace, and you can get that from verse 6. He sent them out in confidence in verse 7, because he had obviously been protecting them, um, Nabal, Shearers, etc., while they was actually tending to the flock. And he sent them out in humility. That's verse 8. But if you notice what David says, he says, um, give me anything you can, basically. He doesn't say, give me this, 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 and this. He says, anything you can. And he signs off by saying, your son, David. And when David's young men came, they spake to Nabal according to all those words in the name of David and ceased. And Nabal answered David's servants and said, who David and who the son of Jesse? There be many servants now a days that break away every man from his master. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed for my shearers and give unto men whom I know not whence they. 12. So David's young men turned their way and went again and came and told him all those sayings. And David said unto his men, Gird ye on every man his sword. And they girded on every man his sword. And David also girded on his sword. And they went up after David about 400 men and 200 abode by the stuff. But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master. And he rode on them. But the men very good unto us, and we were not hurt, neither missed we anything, as long as we were conversant with them when we were in the fields. They were a wall unto us, both by night and day, all the while we were with them, keeping the sheep. So there's a couple of powerful things we see in the text, and the first thing we highlighted is that Nabal is, in fact, who was described as evil previously, is actually following through that narrative, and if you see that from verse 10 of the scripture. Then we see something quite interesting um, in regards to something I alluded to in the previous pieces of text that we read about him being from the from the house of Caleb, obviously ultimately going back to Judah, which is obviously similar to David as well. They're both from, from Judah. But what does he say? He says two things that are actually quite interesting. First, he makes an allusion to David actually kind of dissenting from Saul and actually going out on his own, which is quite interesting. I'll bring that back up in a minute. And the second thing he talks about is, I don't know who you are. Okay, so that's interesting in itself as well, because on one hand, he's alluding to the fact that he doesn't know who he is. But on the other hand, he's also saying, well, I know that you defected from Saul, etc. So that's actually quite interesting. And the final thing we see here, which is actually really powerful as well, is I mentioned this before. I mentioned this before. David came in confidence based on verse seven. And that was that while they were actually shearing the sheep, 
David and his men were actually sort of like sort of protection and were helping Nabal's men so they could actually could share the sheep in peace. But in verse 6, 15 and 16, what do we see? We get a testimony from Nabal's actually servants that that was actually true. So that's another thing that's about as well, that what David was doing and testifying to Nabal was actually true and testified by Nabal's servants themselves. Now therefore, know and consider what thou will do, for evil is determined against our master and against all his household, for he a son of Belial that cannot speak to him. Then Abigail made haste and took two hundred loaves and two bottles of wine and five sheep ready dressed and five measures of parched and a hundred clusters of raisins and two hundred cakes of figs and laid on asses. And she said to, and she said unto her servants, Go on before me, behold, I come after you. But she told not her husband Nabal. And it was, she rode on the ass that she came down by the covert of the hill. And behold, David and his men came down against her and she met them. Now David had said, Surely in vain have I kept all that this hath in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that unto him, and he hath requited me evil for good. So and more also do God unto the enemies of David, if I leave of all that to him by the morning light, any that pisseth against the wall. And when Abigail saw David, she hasted and lighted off the ass, and fell before David on her face, and bowed herself to the ground, and fell at his feet, and said, Upon me, my lord, me, iniquity. And let thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak in thine audience and hear the words of thine handmaid. So in this piece of text we discover, we get some really insightful things, but from the standpoint of Abigail. We've heard that she's beautiful, we've heard that she's wise, and now we're seeing her wisdom actually in action. Because we see from verse 18 to 20, and we're going to see, we saw some of 23 and 24, but this is going to go on to verse 31, we'll cover that in the next of text but we can see that as soon as she hears from one of the, the servants what happened in the transaction between David's ten servants and Nabal and how Nabal actually treated them evilly she uses her wisdom what does she do she basically loads up all this stuff 200 loaves two bottles of wine five dressed sheep five parts 100 clusters of raisins and 200 cakes of figs she gathers all this stuff puts it um, loaded to go and basically she goes off to meet David and she does this all secretly behind Nabal's back now this does open up some sort of conversation of husbands and wives and things you can do she's obviously working behind his back ultimately and she does this in the hope that this gift can appease David and ultimately she can save everyone um, which Nabal obviously wasn't willing to do let not my lord I pray thee regard this man of Belial Nabal for as his name so he Nabal his name and folly with him but I, thine handmaid, saw not the young men of my Lord whom thou didst send. Now therefore, my Lord, the Lord liveth and thy soul liveth, seeing the Lord hath withholden thee from coming to blood and from avenging thyself with thine own hand. Now let thine enemies and they that seek evil to my Lord be as Nabal. And now this blessing which thine handmaid hath brought unto my Lord, let it even be given unto the young men that follow my Lord. I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thine handmaid, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord, Lord fighteth the battles of the Lord, and evil hath not been found in thee thy days. Yet a man is risen to pursue thee and to seek thy soul, but the soul of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God, and the souls of thine enemies, them shall he sling out of the middle of a sling. And it shall come to pass, when the Lord shall have done to my Lord according to all the good that he hath spoken concerning thee, and shall have appointed thee ruler over Israel, that this shall be no grief unto thee, nor offence of heart unto my Lord, either that thou hast shed blood causeless, or that my Lord hath avenged himself. But when the Lord shall have dealt well with my Lord, then remember thine handmaid. And David said to Abigail, Bless the Lord God of Israel, which sent thee this day to meet me. So Abigail basically blesses David, and I've basically summed everything we've covered in the last piece of text in two things. Nabal doing after the manner of what his name means, according to as Abigail said it, which is a fool. That's what Nabal basically means, foolish. And Abigail basically doing by blessing David, showing her wisdom um, and what she actually said to him. And basically getting to a point where she's uplifting David and speaking well of him and speaking um, prophetically of him about how he's going to take the kingdom, etc. And all those different kind of things. And blessed thou advice and blessed thou which has kept me this day from coming to blood and from avenging myself with mine own hand. For in very deed the Lord God of Israel liveth, which hath kept me back from hurting thee. Except thou hadst hasted and come to meet me, surely there had not been left unto Nabal by the morning light any that pisseth against the wall. 
So David received of her hand which she had brought him, and said unto her, Go up in peace to thine house. See, I have hearkened to thy voice, and have accepted thy person. And Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he held a feast in his house, like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart merry within him, for he very drunken. Wherefore she told him nothing, less or more, until the morning light. But it came to pass in the morning, when the wine was gone out of Nabal, and his wife had told him these things, that his heart died within him, and he became a stone. And it came to pass about ten days that the Lord smote Nabal that he died. And when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Bless the Lord that hath pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal, and hath kept his servant from evil. For the Lord hath returned the wickedness of Nabal upon his own head, and David sent and communed with Abigail to take her to him to wife. And when the servants of David were come to Abigail to Carmel, they spake unto her, saying, David sent us unto thee to take thee to him to wife. So this is actually really interesting. The last couple of things in the text we read, which are really powerful. David basically receives the gift from Abigail's hand. But what do we see next? The scripture talks about Nabal having a feast. And I'll put here, this is foolish behavior. Why did I say this is foolish behavior? Because he just got word from people. Ten servants came and basically requested help from him based on some of the goodness they were actually doing for him. And he turned around and said, no, I don't know David, etc. I'm not doing anything. Loads of people defect from their from their nation or their king, etc. all this different kind of stuff. But then he goes to hold a feast, which is obviously foolish behavior. Um, and then on top of that, the other thing I put in, not only in the fe is the feast a foolish behavior, he's actually getting drunk, he's drunken to the point where he's obviously intoxicated, he's gone past sobriety and doesn't even know what he's doing, to the point where Abigail didn't even mention the thing to him that day, but when she basically tells him in the morning, it says his heart became as a stone. And the scripture talks about how 10 days later, the Lord basically wiped him out. And I'll put here, in just in brackets, 10 men's question mark. Was it 10 days later because 10 men came to see him? Um, just a bit of food for thought, something for you to digest and think about for yourself. We've seen God do stuff like that, similar to um, in the past, like with the 40 days it took for them to travel to the promised land and back, that all ultimately was turned into 40 years of punishment. And obviously we've got here to end, Abigail is basically asked to be David's wife. That's what David obviously wants. And I put here a question mark in brackets, verse 31. And I'm putting that there to allude to the fact that when Abigail was basically blessing David and going through that whole kind of monologue speech, okay, she basically said something really interesting to end in verse 31. She said basically, and when all of this stuff happens to you, basically remember her. It's actually quite interesting because this goes all the way back and kind of alludes to the fact that Nabal, as she described, was a fool, as his name suggests, and that he was an evil man, verse 10. So maybe she was having problems in that relationship. Obviously, he's referenced as a son of Belial earlier on in the text. He's a fool. He's got doing foolish behavior. He's an evil man, etc. And she seems to be some sort of godly woman. So I don't know how they obviously them two actually got together. But whatever the reason is, she's having problems in those marriages in that marriage and she's basically saying to david remember me um when all this stuff happens and you're blessed and obviously he dies 10 days later and abigail is basically elevated to basically queen or wife of the king to be which is actually quite powerful and she arose and bowed herself on face to the earth and said behold thine handmaid a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my lord and Abigail hasted and arose and rode upon an ass with five damsels of hers that went after her. And she went after the messengers of David and became his wife. David also took Ahinoam of Jezreel, and they were also both of them his wives. But Saul had given Michal, his daughter David's wife, to Fauti, the son of Laish, which of Galim. So the scripture basically says she obliges to the request of marriage. And the chapter basically ends by the scripture telling us that David obviously took Abigail to be his wife. He also took another woman called Ahinoam to be his wife from Jezreel and that his previous wife Michal, which was Saul's daughter, Saul had basically taken her and like her older sister Mirab, if I remember correctly, had given her to another man as well. So David now obviously lost a wife and gained two wives, so to speak. And this is likely probably one of the first times in David's arc in his narrative through the scriptures that he's run into problems. Okay. Now, this is going to be um, a severe problem going forward. I'm not going to mention it much more than that because obviously we'll get there. I want this to be fresh for you, etc. But God said all the way back in the Torah, Deuteronomy, Exodus, etc., that a king 
should not multiply wives, okay? Always problems are going to happen when you multiply wives. And David has fallen into this trap. And the Ziphites came unto Saul to Gibeah, saying, Doth not David hide himself in the hill of Hakila before Jeshimon? Then Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph, having three thousand chosen men of Israel with him to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul pitched in the hill of Hakila, which before Jeshimon, by the way. But David abode in the wilderness, and he saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness. David therefore sent out spies and understood that Saul was coming very deep. And David arose and came to the place where Saul had pitched, and David beheld the place where Saul lay. And Abner, the son of Ner, the captain of his host, and Saul lay in the trench, and the people pitched round about him. Then answered David and said to Ahimelech the Hittite, and to Abishai the son of Zeruiah, brother to Joab, saying, Who will go down with me to Saul to the camp? And Abishai said, I will go down with thee. So David and Abishai came to the people by night, and behold, Saul lay sleeping within the trench, and his spear stuck in the ground at his bolster. But Abner and the people lay round about him. Then said Abishai to David, God hath delivered thine enemy into thine hand this day. Now therefore let me smite him, I pray thee, with the spear even to the earth at once, and I will not him the second time. So a couple of things that are interesting in, in how we start the chapter. So just before we get into the text we just covered, I want to go back to something Nabal said earlier that I didn't address at the time, and I wanted to bring this up because it was really important. So when Nabal was basically saying, who is David? I don't know who David is, and loads of people defect from kings, etc. I wanted to make the point that he may have been thinking that, you know what, where Saul had actually basically wiped out certain places before, if you remember, he wiped out some of the priests, about 80 priests or something like that, and wiped out the city in one of the previous studies we did in 1 Samuel, that could have been another reason why he didn't want to help David, because he was thinking, well, if I help David, I've got all of this wealth, etc., and Saul's going to hear about it and basically wipe me out. Now linking it back to this, which is really significant as well, we saw in the previous chapter as well, which is another thing which is relevant, it seemed to be, based on the previous video we did in, the, in this study, that Saul and David had actually mended the fence, so to speak. Saul had come round and started to realise that there's no point in attacking David, but we see that in the last chapter that he gave his daughter to another guy, which is actually quite interesting. And then obviously here we see that the Ziphites are triggering Saul. They're basically saying, oh, David's here, David's there. And he basically takes 3,000 men again to go and basically pursue David as when he did previously when he had taken thousands of men to go after him as well. Then we actually see that David hears about this and basically sends spies out to basically go and search out and see if it's actually true that Saul's actually come and Saul had actually come. So David sends basically some of his, he says to some of his key men basically, who wants to go down with me into the camp? Abishai is one of the guys that says he wants to go. So David and Abishai go down and infiltrate Saul's camp. And basically they find Saul sleeping in the middle of basically the host of the people. That makes sense. Put the king in the middle and obviously um, tent out, okay, um, spread out after. So they find him sleeping. Abishai says, look, God has delivered Saul into your hand this night, basically. Let me basically kill him. And he says something really funny. He says, look, let me just strike him once. I won't even strike him a second time. And if you've been following along with us in this narrative, there's been different times when David's been in the position to basically kill Saul. And you can probably guess if you've been following us what David's actually going to say. And obviously, if you haven't been following along with us anyway, the fact that you know this has actually happened before and he's still in the scenario kind of gives you the answer anyway. And David said to Abishai, destroy him not, for who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David said furthermore, the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him, or his day shall come to die, or he shall descend into battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed, but I pray thee, take down now the spear that at his bolster, and the cruise of water, and let us go. So David took the spear and the cruise of water from Saul's bolster, and they got them away, and no man saw, nor knew. Neither awaked, for they all asleep, because a deep sleep from the Lord was fallen upon them. Then David went over to the other side, and stood on the top of a hill of far off a great space between them. And David cried to the people and to Abner, the son of Ner, saying, Answerest thou not Abner? Then Abner answered and said, Who thou cries to the king? So what do we see? Surprise, surprise. David says, No, we're not going to kill Saul. Um, and he sticks with that theme of who can literally lift up their hand and strike the Lord's anointed. And it's really interesting because what does he say next? He says, Look, they, Saul's, David says Saul's going to die another way. Whether the Lord takes him out 
whether he does something silly or something happens to him or he goes into battle and he's basically killed but i'm not gonna have my hands shed his blood because he's the lord's anointed and then basically what david says is he says to abishai take the spear and take the cruise of water that's at his bolster so he wants to take these things and the reason i put here in brackets the skirt is because Again, something we previously covered in earlier in the book of Samuel, when something like this similar happened before, they were in a cave, David basically cut the skirt, which I alluded to at the time, was like the corner, which was where the authority was, basically. And I alluded to where God has basically talked about how he covered his skirt over Israel um, at some point in the future, um, later on in the Old Testament. And obviously we hear about, in the book of Ruth, Ruth says to Boaz, cover your skirt over me, basically, which is a sign, which was a sign of authority basically but david takes these two things and then he basically escapes out of the camp no one basically catches them and he goes up to a hill far away where there's a big gap and he starts shouting now he doesn't start shouting to Saul; he starts shouting to abner basically and abner basically wakes up and starts saying look who are you that's basically shouting on crying for the king and not actually understanding what's actually happened that he's able to actually allow them to infiltrate the camp and get to the king which they could have killed him if, he, if they wanted to and basically escape so that's actually another dynamic variable to add to this scenario as well. And David said to Abner, Not thou a man, and who like to thee in Israel? Wherefore then hast thou not kept thy lord the king? For there came one of the people in to destroy the king thy lord. This thing not good that thou hast done. The lord liveth ye worthy to die, because ye have not kept your master, the lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear and the cruise of water that at his bolster. And Saul knew David's voice and said, This thy voice, my son David. And David said, My voice, my lord, O king. And he said, Wherefore doth my lord thus pursue after his servant? For what have I done, or what evil in mine hand? Now therefore I pray thee, let my lord the king hear the words of his servant. If the lord have stirred thee up against me, let him accept an offering. But if the children of men curse day before the lord, for they have driven me out this day from abiding in the inheritance of the lord, saying, Go, serve other gods now therefore let not my blood fall to the earth before the face of the lord for the king of israel is come out to seek a flea as when one doth hunt a partridge in the mountains then said saul i have sinned return my son david for i will no more do thee harm because my soul was precious in thine eyes this day behold behold i have played the fool and have erred exceedingly so what basically happens as you can see here is that saul repents again We've seen this story before. I've alluded to it already. But what happened previously was David had him in a situation like this in a cave. He basically did the basic kind of similar thing, basically started communicating with him. And Saul turned around and repented and said, oh, you know what? Um, I shouldn't have done this, etc. You had my soul was basically precious in your sight and you did me no harm. So I'm not going to do you any more harm, etc. This is the second time at least we've seen this happen. There were previous times, but situations are very similar to this. This has happened before, just a few chapters previously. So this is actually really interesting from that standpoint. And another thing you continue to see is David's humility in all of this situation in regards to um, him versus Saul, if you want to call it that. Because what does he say? He says, look. If I've done anything wrong to you, accept an offering. Let me make an offering to God, basically. Let us make a peace um, sort of offering between each other and let us go our separate ways. Or um, if it's the people that have basically stirred all the stuff up and now they're basically driving them out from living in God's inheritance, the promised land, basically. And they're driving them out to other places, which obviously he doesn't want to live, he'd rather be in his homeland, etc. 22. And David answered and said, Behold the king's spear, and let one of the young men come over and fetch it. The Lord rendered to every man his righteousness and his faithfulness, for the Lord delivered thee into your hand today. But I will not stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed. And behold, as thy life was much set by this day in mine eyes, so let my life be much set by in the eyes of the Lord, and let him deliver me out of all tribulation. Then Saul said to David, Bless thou, my son David, thou shalt both do great, and also shalt still prevail. So David went on his way, and Saul returned to his place. And this chapter basically ends by David going one way, and Saul going the other way, and then basically departing in peace, so to speak. Chapter 27, And David said in his heart, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. 
nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines, and so shall dis despair of me to seek me any more in any coast of Israel, so shall I escape out of his hand. And David arose, and he passed over with the six hundred men that with him unto Achish the son of Maok, king of Gath. And David dwelt with Achish at Gath, he and his men, every man of his household, David with his two wives, Ahinoam the Jezreelites, and Abigail the Carmelites, Nabal's wife. And it was told Saul that David was fled to Gath, and he sought no more again for him. So what's actually really interesting is what David actually says first and foremost to start the chapter. He talks about how, in his mind, one way, shape or form, the death of him is going to be through Saul. And the reason he's probably thinking this is because he continues to go, as we kind of just alluded to previously, Saul and David continue to get into these kind of situations where Saul tries to kill him, then somehow he's appeased or somehow he says he's repenting and all this different kind of stuff, but it continues to happen. So David uses this fear ultimately basically to say, look, I'm going away. And he basically goes back to Achish to Gath. Now you remember this one previously in the book of Samuel, where he went there and fled there the first time. And because they were basically talking about him as, oh, the Philistine conqueror, basically, he basically acted as he was crazy, and Akish basically sent him away, and he got away that way. So he's actually going back now, and he's basically going to stay there with his two wives. And the scripture talks about how when Saul heard that he'd gone to the Philistines, Saul sought him no more. Why is that? Because obviously, if Saul now goes to pursue after David, what's going to happen? He's going to get into war with the Philistines, which is obviously something he doesn't really want to do. Okay, Most smart kings out there aren't going to go and try and pick battles with people that they've been battling with over and over again just for one guy. He might as well just leave him alone and let him be. And David said unto Achish, If I have now found grace in thine eyes, let them give me a place in some town in the country that I may dwell there. For why should thy servant dwell in the royal city with thee? Then Achish gave him Ziklag that day, wherefore Ziklag pertaineth unto the kings of Judah unto this day. And the time that David and the time that David dwelt in the country of the Philistines was a full year and four and four months. And David and his men went up and invaded the Geshurites and the Gezrites and the Amalekites, for those of old the inhabitants of the land, as thou goest to Shur unto the land of Egypt. And David smote the land, and left neither man nor woman alive, and took away the sheep, and the oxen, and the asses, and the camels, and the apparel, and returned, and came to Achish. And Achish said, Whither have you made a road today? And David said, Against the south of Judah, and against the south of the Jerimelites, and against the south of the Kenites. And David saved neither man nor woman alive to bring to Gath, saying, Lest they should tell on us, saying, so did David, and so his manner all the while he dwelleth in the country of the Philistines. And Achish believed David, saying, He hath made his people Israel utterly to abhor him. Therefore shall he be my servant for ever. So what basically happens to end the chapter is really interesting, and it gives us some insights into David's character or David's agenda. So the first thing we see is that David, after some time, goes to the king Achish and says, Look, why am I staying in the royal city with you? Basically, I'm not worthy. Let me have some place to stay. Akish decides to give him a city called Ziklag. And the scripture tells us, basically, because David was dwelling in this place, ultimately, when he became a king, that obviously passed over into David's kingdom, David's territory, etc. So he, Ziklag was a part of the Israelite cities as well. Next, we see that David stayed there a whole year and four months. And to conclude, it talks about how he went to invade certain places in the south of Judah. Now, it says some, some stuff quite interesting. It talks about how he didn't let anyone live. But one thing that's really key is it talks about how he these were people that dwelt there of old. So even before the Israelites moved there, that's what, one thing that's really interesting. Because then it goes back to some of the things God said to the Israelites when it came to potentially getting ready to go into the promised land about how you shouldn't let anyone live, you shouldn't spare any of them. That's the first thing. Secondly, um, we covered 1 Samuel 15 not long ago, but we've got a specific video about that as well. I'm going to post that in the description box below as well for you to watch about slaying men, women, children, etc. And the final thing is that's really insightful is that it says that David basically wiped everyone out. So and no one would go back to Garth and basically tell them what David was up to, etc. So, on that note, we've basically wrapped up today's video. We've covered 1 Samuel 25 to 27. Um, I hope this has actually been helpful to you, and I recommend you watch this video right here next. 
because it's a great video free to watch based on what's covered so far in today's video. Thanks and take care.